got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some of the past interviews you can check out, founder of P90X, founder of RX Bar, founder of Atari. They talk about not just the ups, but the downs and the journey. Um, this interview is a little bit different. This is, was for the Process Breakdown podcast that I did. It was so good that I had to release it on Inspired Insider, so stay tuned. Um, and before you get to it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. What we do is at Rise25, we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships, a podcast for me over, over the past 10 years has allowed me to profile others thought leadership in companies and give to them and have them on my podcast and platform. So if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com. You can watch a video. My business partner and I banter like an old married couple. Check out rise25.com. Thanks. Listen to the episode. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, host of the Process Breakdown podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job. Past guests include David Alling from Getting Things Done, Josh Fonger from Work the System, and many, many more. And before I introduce today's epic guest, if you haven't, first of all, epic guest today, Chester Elton, and I'll introduce him in a second, but if you haven't checked out his website and his videos, you should do it probably every morning because it will inspire you, it will move you into action, and it will create gratitude. Uh, for you in your life. And so this episode is brought to you by Sweet Process. If you've had team members ask you the same questions over and over and over and over again, then you probably realize that is not a sustainable practice and there's a solution for it actually. Sweet Process is a software that makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. So I realized from talking to the founder, Owen, not only do universities and banks and hospitals use it and software companies, but First responder government agencies use them in life or death situations to run their operations. So you can use Sweet Process to document all the repetitive tasks that eat up your precious time so you can focus on growing your team and empowering them. And you can sign up for a 14-day trial, no credit card required. Go to Sweet Process, Sweet Like Candy, S-W-E-E-T process.com. And without further ado, today's guest, um, you know, we're going to talk to uh, Chester Elton, who's leading with gratitude you know, in general in his life, all of his, you know, if you look at, and I encourage you to buy all of his books. Um, I bought several myself. Um, but the world's best culture is trust Chester companies like Starbucks, Johnson and Johnson state farm. If I read all of them, Chester, we'd be here for another 20 minutes. So I'm not going to, but, um, check out their website. The culture works. Um, you know, Chester has spent decades helping clients engage their employees to execute on strategy, vision, and values. And he's the number one best-selling leadership, you know, best-selling author on leadership. Him and Adrian Gostick with books like All In, The Best Team Wins, The Care Principle, and Leading with Gratitude, The Eight Leadership Practices for Extraordinary Business Results. You know, he provides real solutions for lots of companies. And so check it out. And Chester, you know, I just, I need people to go to YouTube or maybe LinkedIn and check out your videos. And I'm not even going to ruin any of the punchlines, but they do call it the apostle appreciation, but to, for the full effect, they have to watch your videos. Okay. Well, the full effect. Well, that's, that's, that's quite the introduction. Yeah. And, I, and uh, spoiler alert, there's always a happy ending. So <laughs> you have to worry about, you know, the gotcha at the end. And, you know, with Adrian, uh, my co-author, we, we, for 20 years, we really have been dedicated to studying workplace culture and leadership in teams. And that common thread that we always found in extraordinary leaders and extraordinary cultures was this idea of gratitude, uh, appreciation, recognition. You know, you can use a lot of different words there that they really did celebrate. They celebrated their people. They celebrated their customers. They celebrated their communities. And I think more than ever, as we go through this pandemic, the need for people to be remembered you know, you talk about recognition as a recognition, a remembering. 
is is more important than ever because you know we're we're feeling more and more isolated, more and more vulnerable, more and more just alone. And this idea of remembering each other and celebrating each other, I think, isn't one of those nice to haves that so many people will put it in the category of. It is an absolute must have to keep people safe mentally, emotionally, and engage them and make it safe for them to continue to be productive. Yeah, I feel like sometimes gratitude for some people, I don't know, it's more of a natural practice and some it's not. How do you get people to practice it regularly when maybe it's not natural for them? You know, it's a learned skill like anything else. And, and I really appreciate you bringing that up, Jeremy, because people say, well, I'm just not wired that way. So that, that may be true. You know, maybe the way you were brought up or the way you were managed or whatnot just doesn't lead you to believe that it's important. Well, we've got a massive database of over a million engagement surveys that says, look, if you're not, if you're not using the tool of gratitude in your, in your leadership toolbox, you're missing out on a huge way to really attract, engage, and, and, and you know, spur productivity. So, so we give people tools. You know, every one of our books, we have data, we have case studies, and then here's the how-to. Mm-hmm. You know, the data in the case studies without the how-to is just an interesting story, right? The how-to and, and how leaders have done it. And I think importantly, how leaders have been converted to that whole process, right? Where they, they didn't think it was valuable. Hubert Jolie, for example, who took Best Buy from a billion-dollar deficit to a billion-dollar surplus. He said, I, I was not a believer. I really wasn't. Why was wasn't like, he? Hey, well, he says, look, you know, we're process driven. We're like, you know, we got hard things to do. We're going to do them. We're going to check the boxes. It's, it's all about getting the compensation, right? It's about getting the process, right? And plug it in. It's called work for a reason. And if you don't want to work, you don't work here. You know, I mean, it was very simple, right? And there's a lot of people that lead like that. And then he said, you know, it, it became very evident to me that making work meaningful was the key to really engaging people's hmm. hearts, not just their minds. And he said, and part of that process was, celebrating their contributions. He said it made all the difference. He's got a philosophy of assuming positive intent. And I love that in Mm. leaders. He said, look, I may be naive. I just think people come to work and they want to do a good job. You know, 999 people out of a thousand come to work wanting to do a good job. And in trying to do a good job, they're going to make mistakes. And you know what? That's okay. We can fix the mistake and, and move on. Well, When you're in a culture like that, where when you make a mistake, you don't fear for your job or try to hide it or hope that nobody notices, right? Where you can admit that you've made a mistake, ask for help, correct it, and move on. Well, talk about lowering stress levels and increasing endorphins and and, and happiness in the workplace. And, you know, listen, from a billion-dollar deficit to a billion-dollar surplus, when a guy like that talks, I listen. You know, you mentioned the how-to, and then you mentioned celebration. Of contribution. What are some of the favorite? Um, well, we'll talk about some of the things people put in place, but what are some of your favorite? Maybe uh, you've worked with a lot of companies, celebrations that people have with contributions of staff members or team members. Yeah, you know, Bill Manning is one of our heroes. He's the president of Toronto FC up in, you know, in the MLS. And we knew him when he was the president of Real Salt Lake. And he's taken both organizations to MLS finals numerous times and won won two cups. And he said, you know, it's always going to be about your people, particularly in their business where they are fan facing, at least they hope to be fan facing, you know, again, uh, soon. One of the things he did that I loved is he would have staff meetings once a week. And, you know, on game day, you've got a few hundred people on your staff. Most of that is outsourced. You know, the guys in the parking lot and security and so on. Your actual staff is maybe 30, 40 people. Well, he'd bring them together once a week to go over everything, you know, season ticket holders, cleanliness, whatever it might be. And he started this tradition where he would randomly call out someone in the group to recognize someone else in the group. Mm. And so, you know, in his expressions of gratitude, he gave them permission to do the same and then created a vehicle by which they could do it. Mm. And he said, I knew it was really great when, you know, Susan was up there and said, look, I just want to really recognize Tom. Tom's always been really helpful. And over the last month, he's, and Tom gets up and he says, I've been waiting for three months to be called up so that I could recognize Denise. And so he took his award, which by the way, was like a $300 gift card. It was, it was, it was a nice award, right? A nice gift. And he gave away his $300 gift card to Denise because mm. he'd wanted to recognize her for so long. And he said, and when you get peer to peer recognition, mm you get a culture of recognition. You know, so often leaders 
think that they're the the givers of all goodness, right? Mm. I, 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 I've got a monopoly and, and it, it couldn't be further from the truth. You want that cross-pollination. You want a culture and that happens. Peer -to -peer. Great, uh, great best practice. One other, and, and I love You can one. go, keep going with, yeah, no, no, no don't go one other, keep, 10 others, keep going, yeah. Okay, well, uh, books a million. You know, uh, love them. They've got stores. They do a lot of stuff online. I got to present to them. It was one of the last presentations I did, actually, before the, the country shut down. And they do simple little things. Like in their break rooms, they've got all these little thank you cards that you can just pull one out with their mm. core value. It ties it to one of their core values. It's customer service. It's integrity. It's, you know, uh, bringing books to the, to the needy, whatever it might be. And they can just write each other little handwritten notes. There's an envelope. You can mail it to somebody. And again, uh, having that rack of thank you cards, it, it says, look. Not Makes only it easy for people. Well, sure. Not only do you have permission here, do it, you know. And, mm. uh, and then lastly, uh, I always like to work in threes, you know, the power of three, uh, is uh, uh, Carlos Aguilera, uh, manager in uh, Dallas, Texas for Avis Budget Rental Car. And he says, look, I, I just need to be very intentional about my gratitude and I need to be disciplined. So what he does is he puts 10 coins in his left pocket every morning. And he said very intentionally, he sets a goal to have 10 positive interactions with his people every day. And the way he keeps track, he moves a penny from his left pocket to his right pocket. He says, look, if I get to lunch and I've got eight pennies in my left pocket, I'm not doing my job. Hmm. And you just love the simplicity of that and the intentionality and the discipline, right? So when he shows up to the kiosk at Love Field or you know Dallas International, whatever it might be, well, how do you think his people react? It's positive. Totally. Right? love it. He's not there to, to beat them up because he's the boss and they're not. He's there to point out all the wonderful little things that are going right every day. And he, when they have their huddles, he starts it with, with, with appreciation and gratitude and he ends it with appreciation and gratitude. Now, when he's got to have a tough conversation with somebody, do you think they're more coachable? Of, of course they are. He's got a whole bank of, you know, as, as Stephen Kevin said, he's got a bank of goodwill that says all those interactions that we had that were so positive. Now, you know what? You've screwed up. We, we, we've got to address that. And, and people are so open. You, from, come, you come from a place of love. They know you come from a place of love for, for you and want to help you as opposed to this, you know, being fearful. Exactly. So, you know, letting people recognize other people on your team in public to thank you cards in the break room to, you know, putting 10 coins in your left pocket, a couple of, uh, of ideas. And, you know, in our book, Leading with Gratitude, we've got many, many, many more. You know, one of my favorite stories that you tell is about um, uh, you got it to your home, uh, orange flowers, I think. It right. Was. And it shows, first of all, companies are actually listening to you. And when someone shows gratitude, it makes you want to work even harder for that. I, I want to just tell that quick story. That, that's one of my favorite stories. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, my, I, was, I was traveling and I, I'll never forget. I was at the Dulles Airport talking to our then CEO, Kent Taylor, and solving some kind of problem with a customer. If you've ever been to Dulles Airport, by the way, your connecting flight is a real adventure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that airport is set up for you to miss your connecting <laughs> flight, right? So anyway, I'm looking for the gate and, uh, you know, we close the call. The phone rings again and caller ID, it's my wonderful wife, Heidi. And so I pick it up right away. You want to be happily married <laughs> when your wife calls you, you pick up, right? I said, honey, what's up? And she said, Jess, you're not going to believe what just happened. Uh, a guy just delivered 24 beautiful, long-stemmed orange roses to the house. And then she said, it was really funny. She goes, you know, at first I thought they were from you. <laughs> and of course I knew they weren't. <laughs> and I was kind of curious who they were from, you know, and uh, it was from my boss, Kent, uh, Kent Murdoch. And, and the note said, look, Heidi, we really appreciate you taking care of all the big things at home. So Chester can do big things on the road and enjoy the flowers, all the best. Kent, you know, the sacrifice is lost on us. And uh, amazing. Yeah, it was just so sweet. And, and it wasn't just that they were orange roses because we love roses and we love flowers it's that there were 24 of them because we wrote a book called the 24 carat manager mm. so all those little things you know made me feel great about being on the road for kent more importantly it made my wife feel great about supporting yeah. me because the, the end of the conversation is my favorite she says where are you i said well i'm at dallas airport looking for my connecting flight she says well don't you dare miss that flight those are good people you're working for yeah right for a couple of roses right
One of the th- reasons I love that story is you don't just have to recognize the person, but you could recognize their family, you know, and have gratitude and appreciation for their family as well for allowing you to help the organization. So I love that story. And there's another story about Gary Ridge. Yeah, I love Gary. G-A-R-R-Y, by the way. Don't forget that extra R. Got it. What was that story? Well, WD-40. I've even got my travel can with me. I don't go anywhere without it. <laughs> Everybody... I'm curious how many times you've used it on the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, those wheels on your wheelie, you know, they get squeaky. And... That's true. That's true. You know, Especially you. Yes. 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 Well, not any, not right now. Hopefully in the, in the near future. Well, you know, he was so interesting. Uh, and we've gotten to be dear friends uh, over the years. Uh, you know, Gary said, look, in the last recession, 2008, 2009, I'm touring our facilities and people are asking me, hey, Gary, are you okay? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, no, seriously, Gary, are you okay? He goes, yeah, no, I'm, listen, I'm doing great. And he's, by the way, one of the happiest guys you'll ever meet. So finally, he keeps getting it everywhere he goes. He calls his wife and he says, honey, do I give off like a, an unwell vibe? Like, do, I, do, I, do I look sick? I mean, she goes, Gary, they're not asking you, are you okay? They're asking, are we okay? Hmm. And the light bulb went off and he said, at that moment, I said to myself, well, let's not waste a good crisis, <laughs> right? And I love that attitude. He said, so right away, I started to up my communication and up my gratitude and said, look, we may not be hiring a lot of people right now. We're not going to be able to lay people off. We're in good financial straits. We're going to invest in you. We're going to invest in research. He calls his company a tribe because at a tribe, we defend each other, we feed each other, we cheer for each other, right? It's, it's a much more intimate way of looking at your organization. Well, after all that investment and, and the goodwill that obviously came from that, 2010, they were up like over 30% and continued that trajectory where they're now 300 uh, times as their market cap. I mean, they went from like, that's something like 280 million to 2.8 billion. That's, that's good growth. <laughs> you know, again, so I hope the message is coming through to people that are listening. Is it a nice thing to do? Absolutely. Make your mama proud? You bet. Does it have an impact on your bottom line and, and, and your growth as a company? Absolutely. A billion dollar deficit to a billion dollar surplus. 300% uh, market cap. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, the evidence is there. And yet, so many leaders still don't don't believe it. And I guess I should be grateful because that gives me work. <laughs> On the other hand, yeah. <laughs> it, it makes for miserable places for people to go to work every day. You know? Who's been, Chester, you know, out of your really, your long career, who's been the most skeptical that turned, that was able to kind of see not just, oh, this is just soft skills. This is like, a, you know, a nice to have, not a need to have. Who's, who's been or organization been the most skeptical and the, like, once they saw the light, they were the biggest convert. Well, you know, uh, Hubert Jolie at, uh, at Best Buy was not a believer, you know? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I know Hubert well, and I never say his name right. It says, great friend, Hubert, you know, Jolie. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll tell you the one, the story that I love the, the most is uh, Dave Kirpin. Now, Dave Kirpin has a wonderful company called Likeable in, in New York City. It's uh, online uh, advertising. It helps people get, you know, a really good presence on Facebook. He's all about the orange, too. He is. Uh, he and I share the, the misery of both being <laughs> Mets fans, <laughs> which also is orange by coincidence. And um, he was very skeptical. And he's told me the story time and time again. He said, look... It, you know, and he's a typical New York, you know, grew up in New York, get it done. Hard charging. Hey, yeah, yeah, hey, I'm walking here. You I mean, know. Their, their wedding, I remember hearing the story that they even monetized the wedding. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> he, was, he was looking for a Got sponsor. sponsorship, yeah. yes. So <laughs> I hear you on that, yes. So I'm glad you know, Dave. So anyway, he was like, look, I, and I'd interview all these leaders, and he, you know, I'm like a sponge. I want to learn, and I'm talking to these guys, and... And this gratitude thing keeps coming up again and again and again. And I'm thinking, maybe there's a little... You know when someone, Chester, said calls it this gratitude thing? They're like a bit <laughs> of a skeptic. <laughs> yeah. So what is... So this thing, yeah. What, what is that? You know, tell me a little bit more about that, you know? Anyway, so he said, so I started to try it. And he said, it changed everything. In fact, you know, Dave has got this wonderful best practice because we interviewed him for Leading with Gratitude. As you might guess, you know, Dave is, is just oozes you know gratitude and goodness and 
you can't help but be around Dave and he cheers you up, right? He said, uh, you know, this was pre-COVID, clearly even more important now that we're in COVID. He said, uh, our kids, we'd have to, we, we'd try to have dinner with them as much as possible. And, you know, we are having the same conversations over and over. It wasn't going anywhere. We'd say, how was school? And they'd say, fine. I'd say, well, what did you learn? They go, nothing. <laughs> you know, they, they'd eat and they'd One nothing. word answers. Right. Yeah. So he said, so we changed the rules. We said, you got to answer three questions. Tell me about the best part of your day. Hmm. Tell me who you're grateful for that's not at the table. And tell me who you're grateful for who is at the table who hasn't been thanked yet. And he said, you know, it just brought a, a just, you know, a lovely feeling and spirit into our, our meals. You got to brag about your day, something that was really fun. You got to talk about somebody that you that you love that isn't part of the family. And then you got to tell somebody in the family that you love them. He said, I knew it really caught on when when they'd bring a friend to dinner and I could hear him saying, no, look, you got to answer three questions. Okay. Don't, don't embarrass me. <laughs> the best part of your day. You've got to, and, 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 you know, he's, They're that's prepping I, yeah, yeah. They were, they were coaching him up, you know? So I, I love Dave's story because it's the classic cynical New York attitude that just did a complete 180 and his businesses have thrived because of it. Thank you for sharing that. Everyone should think about using that at the dinner table. Right. Yeah. I love that. Well, you know, oh. we end the, we end the book with what we call the Baker's Dozen because the leaders that we studied, you know, whether it was Ken Chenault, the retired uh, CEO of American Express or Gary Ridge at, at WD-40 and on and on, they all practiced it at home, which I found so lovely because it wasn't just what they did at work. They didn't leave yeah. their best selves at work. It, it, it became who they, who they are. And that is such an important part of their character. Mm. You know, Chester, in your book, you talk about a lot of different myths and breaking yeah. through some of those myths. I was wondering, which do you consider one of the most common ones and, and talk about it? Yeah, uh, well, we, we, we take seven of the most common. And the one that always has irked me for forever is I don't have enough time. You know, I, look, we're, I'm doing more with less. Hey, we're in a pandemic here, right? Uh, I got to get stuff done. If I had more time, I absolutely, I would do it. And say, look, how much time does it really take? How much time does it really take for you to text somebody and say, hey, I saw what you did there with that customer. That was awesome. Or to pull somebody aside and say, you know, listen, I know you got a lot of stuff going on at home. Can't tell you how much I appreciate you showing up every day and doing your best, right? In fact, we actually broke it down. We said, you know, the average leader probably works about a 50 hour a week, you know, and uh, they take about an hour every week. It's 2%, 2% of their time. Now, if, if, you're, if you really are a student of leadership and you wanna be a better leader and you wanna be more efficient, can you carve out 2% to do something that you think will exponentially grow your business and engage your people? If you can't make that commitment, then you're, you're not committed to being a great leader. So that one has always bothered me. I don't have time. If I had yeah. the time, you know. It takes five seconds. It does. You know, uh, even if, even if, by the way, even if you're going way out of your way, say, you know what? I'm going to write them on. Thank you. Note. Gee, there's maybe five minutes. <laughs> right. And that's, and that's if you, you know, spend half that time looking for a stamp. So it's, it, it, it is, <laughs> right. it, you know, and, and again, it comes back to, you know, our, our friend at Avis Budget, uh, where you have to be intentional and you have to be disciplined. And one hour a week is not uh, an egregious amount of time. Yeah. I mean, all of the CEOs, leaders, people in general that I've talked to, the way they've, you know, not only, you know, went and increased the organization, but the way they've fought, when I ask, you know, what's been the lowest point, what's been a challenge point, and how did you push through it? The pushing through it part was always about how they have gratitude for what they have. Oh, personally. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, we talk about a, a wonderful practice, and actually my wife have been a, and I've been doing it for a few years now, is a gratitude journal. Mm -hmm. You know, just at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day write down three to five things you're grateful for. And, you know, uh, with the virus, if you're sheltering in place, if you're not one of those people that needs to be out and about, um, you know, a sunny day is something to be grateful for. It just, it, it, you know, and, and I think we took sunny days for granted, at least in the Northeast. Like, you're living in San Diego, I get it. Every day is a sunny day, right? Um, not in Chicago. Yeah, like, yeah, you get it. Chicago is like, you know... Uh, a sunny day lifts your If it's spirit. not snowing, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or windy or just, you know, miserable. 
So simple things, like I heard the birds this morning, you know, uh, a, I had a fox run through my yard. I haven't seen a fox for forever. And I thought, first of all, I thought, hey, are you supposed to be out during the day? Uh, is that safe for you? And, and, and secondly, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So, you know, my wife and I, we end the day with a very simple practice. We say, what are your three? What are three things you're, you're grateful for? And, and it's just, you know, studies have been done at, you know, University of Pennsylvania and, and Berkeley that people that are grateful, their blood pressure is lower. They sleep better. You know, we were talking about David uh, Meltzer, the, the famous sports agent and all this stuff. I mean, there's a guy that just says, look, I start every morning saying thank you and I end every day saying thank you. And, uh, and it's, it's changed my life. Yeah. I mean, um, I was talking to one person, uh, Roland Frazier, and, and this, this struck me because there's so many things we take for granted. And he said, uh, when I wake up in the morning, I say, uh, thank God I can see and hear and walk. And I'm like, that was like a head slap for me. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, those are obvious things we take for granted that we can be grateful for. Well, you know, what's the old song? You know, my, my feet hurt until I saw a man who had no legs, you know, and then my feet didn't hurt so much. You know? <laughs> yeah, you exactly. know, you know? So it, it, it is those, those simple things. And, and I know this, it, it may come across to some of this, this is really like Pollyanna stuff. Let me tell you, it's not, it, it isn't. And, and put that out of your head. I, I hate it when people say, well, these are soft skills that are nice to have. No, they're not. And particularly now, I mean, we need to be remembered. I, I'm, I'm always amazed, you know, uh, in the different groups I'm in. Somebody's name will pop into my head and I'll just text them. I've got mm. a friend, Sarah. She's driving back from a graduation thing that they had in Indiana. And I said, hey, I, I know it's a long drive. Just thinking about you. I want to let you know, you know, that I, you, you're remembered and I hope you're safe. And, and the responses you get back are, are amazing. And you think mm. for, for seven seconds of my time, you know, look at the return. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. I can never get enough of this stuff, Chester. And, and that, I mean, that's why I buy all your books. I mean, it's well, a constant you. reminder to do these type of things. So I would encourage anyone to get leading with gratitude. Um, there's one chapter about walk in their shoes. I wonder if you could explain that a little bit. You know, this is, this is such a, a wonderful leadership practice. And I love leaders that have come up through the ranks. You know, we're, we're doing a, a wonderful real-time case study with uh, Texas Roadhouse Restaurants and Kent Taylor, who's the founder and CEO, you know, 67,000 employees didn't lay off one, you know, went from 600 restaurants being 95% in, in restaurant dining revenue to now 100% takeout. Well, now they're starting to open somewhat. In four weeks, uh, not only turned his business around, turned a profit and is, is hiring, is, is paying bonuses. Wow. And, and he's done every job in that restaurant. He's washed the dishes. He's worked behind the bar. He's cut the meat. He's cleaned up. He's, 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 you know, worked the, 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 the desk. And when you have walked in their shoes, you don't make unreasonable demands. You know what it takes to do those jobs. And it makes you appreciative and grateful for the work that happens every day to keep those restaurants open and running. And so I love leaders that really do walk in their employees' shoes because they're, you, you know, uh, and we've all had jobs like this, where, you know, like you're in sales and you get this quote and you go, well, where did that come from? Well, you know, corporate just did the numbers and this is your, you say, well, they have no idea uh, about my territory, do they? Because if they did, they'd never, they'd never give me a ridiculous number. And all it tells me is that they, they don't know the business. They don't know my area. They don't know me. And by the way, they don't care right? Well, with that as a start to every day, how productive you think you're going to be, right? Yeah. As opposed to the guy that's walked in your shoes and said, look, I, I get that it's hard to keep the place clean. Here's what I did. You know, how do you do it? And the, the great, the great um, genius of Kent Taylor is he listens. See how I pause for effect there so people can listen? Yeah. So it's, you know, he does, he asks the questions and he listens. And he says, and when time gets really tough, I, I talk to my crazies. Because they're the guests that are already thinking outside <laughs> the box. Yeah, you think they're already figuring out, hey, we, we can't have the restaurant open. What are we going to do on the curbside? You know, let's, let's do line dancing on the sidewalk six feet apart. Let's show movies on the back of our restaurants so the neighborhood can get a, get a break. And he calls those guys his big dogs, the guys that embrace the challenge and the change. And then I got my more conservative. They're my, my puppies on the porch. And he says, I pair my big dogs with my puppies. <laughs> you know? and, 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 you know, it sounds kind of silly and funny. He says, my people know that they can innovate. They know they can get crazy because I'm the chief crazy officer. 
Hmm. And it's safe. And I love that. Cheshire, how did you get into this? You know, that's a great, as you might guess, I get that question a lot. I, I didn't, this wasn't part of my plan. I grew up in sales. I love selling. I love finding solutions for people and solving problems for them and developing those relationships. And I, I went from selling media time. My, my dad, you know, grew up in radio. He was an announcer and then management. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry he's not here to see this. He would love the headphones and the microphones. Oh, I'm and, sure, totally. And he told me as a kid, he said, "Jess, you got a great face for radio. You know, you should pers- you should pursue that." <laughs> you know, put um pump. <laughs> and and so I loved sales. Well, I went from selling uh, media and, and and you know commercial time to selling recognition programs for 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 Kent uh, Kent Murdoch. And I called him one day and I said, "You know, Kent, if we were the thought leaders in employee recognition and engagement." You'd make my job easier. People would call me. I wouldn't have to call, cold call them. And thought leaders publish. Nobody's really written the definitive book on employee recognition. We should write the book. And he goes, hey, I love that idea. We'll write it. <laughs> I went, Kent, you don't understand. I, I don't, I, I meant, when I said we, I meant you should write the book. I should benefit from said book, right? And he said something that changed everything. He literally said, Chess, you're a smart guy. Figure it out. Hmm. And so he challenged me. And so for about a year, I was, you know, trying to think of what would the title be and what should the chapters be. And, and he called me back. Another, another great leader, right? Remembered and said, you know, Chester, I've always liked your idea of writing the book. I just hired a writer. His name's Adrian Gostick. Mm. You've got the relationships. He knows how to write. Introduce yourself, you know, and write the book. And, and Adrian grew up in Canada, born in England, grew up in Canada. So we had that hockey thing in common. And, and, and a year later, we dropped the book on his desk, you know, managing with carrots. And Kent was so great. He goes, I love being CEO. You say things and then they show up. <laughs> like you have an idea and then people go do it, you know. And, uh, and, and that was the first, uh, Leading with Gratitude is our 12th book together, wow. you know. Five New York Times bestsellers, 1.6 million copies, 30 languages. And, and so we worked really hard at honing our craft. You know, Adrian as a writer and me as a, a person that developed relationships. And, and it's, been a, it's been a really wonderful partnership yeah. that's led us to meet people like Gary Ridge and, and you know, Alan Mulally and, and Uber. Talk about Alan for a second. Well, yeah, you can talk about Alan forever. Are you kidding? I mean, just yeah. the, one of the great leaders of, of our time, you know, saved Boeing uh, from 9-11 and saved the Ford Motor Company from from the uh, economic recession, but both of them could use them again, by the way. Um, and, and this is the perfect example of leading with gratitude, not being a soft skill, being a mm. hard skill, because it, Alan is ridiculously demanding. He holds his people accountable, I mean, 200% and has a whole methodology of, you know, here are your projects, are they red, yellow, or green, and, and, and weekly meetings, and, and really holding people accountable. And at the same time, celebrating all these small wins along the way, you know, making sure that they were engaged. For, for, for example, you know, when he got there, he, he revived the, the, the Taurus car. And that was a big initiative for him. So when it came at the auto show for the unveiling of, of, of the Taurus, right, where most CEOs would say, look, this is my time. This is my spotlight. This is me. I'm new. I want to make a good impression. You know what he did? He got up on stage and he said, look at this beautiful car. It is, it is, it is, it is clean. It is polished. It is beautiful. Who, who, sh- who's responsible for, for shining up this car and making it just glow? Well, it was like two maintenance guys. <laughs> they raised their hands. Come on up on stage. Mm. You know what? We, they deserve our applause because you know what? When you present a new car, you want it to look like this. And I thought, what a spectacular message to the whole organization that, yeah, I'm the CEO and I'm important. And you know what? These guys are too. Let's never forget mm. that. He started at, at Ford Motor Company. Their engagement scores were 20%. 20%. Eight out of 10 people did not want to come to work at Ford every day. Wow. When he left, it was over 90%. And that included the union workers. Now, if you've ever you know, lived in Detroit, and I have for a couple of years, the UAW is not usually your biggest fan if you're an auto you know, uh, manufacturer. So a tribute to Alan. And he says, absolutely. Look, you cannot be, you know, a gratitude Grinch. You know, you're, you've got to cheer for them every step of the way if you want to have remarkable results. And, and no one has more remarkable results 
than Alan Mulally. So Chester, I have one last question. First of all, thank you. Um, I want to point people towards um, wherever you think we should point them, thecultureworks.com. Where else should we, they check out online? Yeah, thecultureworks.com is our training company. We have all kinds of things you can download and tips and there. We're always offering something fun. We were offering, you know, uh, motivators codes and now we're offering this online training at a ridiculous discount. So if you're investing in yourself, uh, thecultureworks.com is a wonderful place to go. When your culture works, everything works, right? We've got a wonderful website called leadingwithgratitudebook.com. You can download the first chapter. You can download the forward by our good friend, Marshall Goldsmith, which really is a lovely story of how he came to really value gratitude hmm. in his coaching, his work, and his life. And then um, there are all the podcasts that we've done that are there available for free and so on. So avail yourself of that. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you've bought many of our books. Anybody can buy just one, by the way, Jeremy. Buy two. One is a gift, right? Bar Mitzvah's Mother's Day is coming up. Uh, how appropriate <laughs> would that be? So, um, and, and follow us on LinkedIn. Adrian and I are constantly posting short videos, and we've got a wonderful LinkedIn Live show where we bring many of the leaders we've talked about as guests. So anything we can do to help you in your journey to become a better leader, those are three great places to go. LinkedIn, thecultureworks.com, and leadingwithgratitudebook.com. Cool. Leadingwithgratitudebook.com. Check it out. I mean, check out their books. They, you know, will change the way you think and change the way you act, more importantly. Um, Chester, my last question, and if you have any other final stories, I'd love to hear them. One of my things, you know, that I was listening to in the past few days when I hear you talk is about the Super Bowl. And it was kind of like a head slap in the face for me um, when you talk about this. So I'd wonder if you, you talk about that for a second. Sure. You know, we, we have so many leaders that say, look, I love to celebrate, you know, when we hit the goal. And I said, oh, well, that, yeah, that's good. I mean, you should, right? You hit the goal, you celebrate. I said, what do you do in between? He says, well, you know, I'm, I'm a tough boss. It's kind of what have you done for me lately? I mean, hit her hard every day. I said, well, are you, are you a sports fan? I go, yeah. Well, do you watch the Super Bowl? Yeah. Is that your team ever been in the Super Bowl? Goes, oh yeah. You know, and they'll, you know, you know, football fans, they know the date, the time. It's almost like when, when they found religion. Right. And uh, I said, well, you know, when you were getting ready for the Super Bowl, like when did you start cheering for your team? They go, Oh, wow. Well, while we were making the guacamole. <laughs> right? They go, yeah. And, and, and painting your face and putting on the jersey, like you cheered with them before the game even started. And then the kickoff and then every play. And, and why did you do that? He said, well, because they're my team. And, 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 I, and I want them to know I'm cheering for it so that they can build momentum. I go, exactly. Why wouldn't you do that for your team? Why wouldn't you find those small wins along the way? Why wouldn't you start cheering? Like we were laughing, you know, before the podcast, I said, you know, when my, when my kids were playing sports, I, I would cheer for them that they got the shoes on the right feet. Right? It was a, like that was a big deal. Right. And so th that mentality of let's build some momentum, let's celebrate so many things. And, and, and you get the momentum, you get people's emotional engagement so that when they hit that hard time, your team, you know, throws a pick six, right? You can continue to cheer because you've got that, that goodwill. They know they've got your back. You know, I, I, I love the old saying that says people don't uh, uh, care about how much you know unless they know how much you care. And, and it is true. You know, again, coming back that, look, right now people are afraid. They are, are vulnerable. We're not waking up in the morning saying what's going to go right today because our news feed tells us everything that's gone wrong, that could go wrong, and probably will go wrong, right? And so we need to fill that void with the good news. My, one of my favorite stories in movies, and I watched them all, is about um, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you know, whether it was the, the movie or the documentary. There was one moment, I can't remember if it was in reading or if it was in one of the films, where he said as a little boy, he said to his mom, he said, Mom, there's a lot of bad news. And she said, yes, there is. And when there's bad news, look for the helpers. There are always people that want to help. So when things are hard, be one of the helpers. And it's always stuck with me. And I thought, you know what? Now more than ever, the world is looking for helpers, leaders that will be helpful, you know, coworkers that will be helpful, 
and let's celebrate the, the incredible heroes out there that are doing everything they can to keep us safe. They're keeping their businesses going like our friends at Texas Roadhouse and, and our families that love and support us. We've got a, a campaign, hashtag find your gratitude. And I've made a commitment to post a, a, just a photo of something that I'm grateful for every day. And you know what? It's a wonderful reminder that in the midst of all this negativity, there is there are places where you can find gratitude and be that helper. And I, I hope when this is all done, the three things happen, that we become more grateful, that we become more kind, and we become more patient with each other. And if that's what comes out of this crisis, you know what, we'll be better people for it. Chester, I want to be the first one to thank you. People should check out leadingwithgratitudebook.com, thecultureworks.com, check out all your books, buy all your books, and thank you so much. Listen, thanks for having me. This has been a delight. You, you can call me anytime. <laughs> Will do. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.